before we get into the program, before we get into uh, the program, I have just a couple of announcements. Um, we believe this is the 48th year of program for the Antiques Club, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we have regular programs and events in the fall uh, through the spring. The attendance to programs is free, uh, but we are a membership organization, it's just $10 per person. And um, that begins in the fall. So our season runs fall through spring. So that's the season of the membership. Um, the funds help us cover the uh, expenses associated with speakers and also um, for the use of the historic Geneva's space when we meet in person and then also their assistance with our online programs. Um, dues can be sent to uh, Josephine Perry, our, our treasurer, and she reported that our current balance is $701.28. I don't know, Josephine, if you have anything else to say at this point. Okay, thank you. So um, several programs and events in the fall, um, and this is our first of the uh, new calendar year. Uh, if you join the Antiques Club, you can stay on our mailing list and uh, learn about future programs as they come along. We have several great programs uh, scheduled for 2023. Uh, there's one on paper and printing, one on uh, Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare, right, Shaker Seed Business. Um, there's one on Redware. Um, our February 25th program is our annual Antiques Roundtable, and this is where you can share an antique item or two with the group um, where you get to talk about it, but also the other group members might be able to fill you in on some things. We usually have a couple of dealers participate in that program as well. This one will be in person at the Geneva History Museum. Um, the last two years we did it online, so we're going to go back to in person this year uh, for that one. That's always a fun time to see what people bring in. Uh, a couple of upcoming and current um, programs and events and exhibits at the at Historic Geneva. Um, they're having a family and friends game day, a couple of them in February. Um, also jigsaw puzzle competition. They've got several exhibits going. So check out their webpage to take a look at the exhibits there that are going on right now at um, Historic Geneva. Uh, other events and and um, exhibits at local historical societies, certainly check their websites if you're not on their email lists or Facebook pages. Um, just I'll note just a couple here, um, ones that I've noted, and that's the Ontario County Historical Society in Canandaigua has a great show called Fiber of Our Art, a Fiber of Our Lives from Practical Craft to Decorative Art, uh, a really well done uh, exhibit that's going on right now. Um, and the Newark Arcadia Historical Society, one of the things that I thought was of interest, they have a collector's corner that they've started, and they've got ice spearing decoys on display right now. So also check for local auctions and shows and sales, um, interest to many of us. Uh, February 12th is the Canadagua Classic Antique Show at the Finger Lakes Gaming and Racetrack. Um, April 1st is the Greater Rochester Spring Antique Show now in um, at the Dome, uh, Minette Hall in Rochester, or Henrietta, I guess it is, uh, on April 1st. And then the Canadagua Show that is put on by the Genesee Country Antique, Steel, Antique Dealers Association is June 17th. So let's get on with this afternoon's program. Uh, Jim Farfaya. Uh, Jim lives in and writes about the history and traditions in central New York. Um, in 2011, he uh, transitioned from a working career to a life, his lifelong interest in writing. So he splits his time between poetry and what he calls story-driven nonfiction. Jim has written several books about central New York. Uh, and today he's gonna be, uh, his talk is based on his book called Voices in the Storm, Stories from the Blizzard of 66. Um, Jim also writes a monthly local history column 
in the uh, online newspaper Oswego County Today. He also has a website, so you can learn a lot more about him and what he's doing, um, and he will have uh, that posted um, at the end of his talk. So welcome to Jim. I just ask everybody to remain muted during the talk and hold your questions till the end, and then we'll be able to have a, a question and answer period. Um, so go ahead, Jim. Thank you, Marty. And uh, just one clarification there. So today I'm talking about uh, historic snowstorms of central New York. Okay. Uh, not the blizzard of 66, although we are going to talk about the blizzard of 66. Uh, we're going to, we're going to mention that, but this program will go, um, will go, uh, much beyond, uh, farther back in history. Uh, let's start my first slide here. Okay. Everybody see that. Okay. Yes, everything look okay there? It looks good, thanks, Jim. Okay, thank you. So, um, but as, as Marty mentioned, uh, so why why would I write a book about historic snowstorms of central New York? Well, first of all, I am a snow lover. Uh, as I look out my window now here in Oswego County, we finally have a few inches of snow on the ground. Uh, it's been a pretty dry winter for those of us that love snow. Um, but I also, um, you know, Snow is a part of our history here in Central New York, as you well know. And uh, as Marty also mentioned, I my books are heavily dependent on the stories people remember from major events in Central New York, and snowstorms is one of those things. So, uh, but uh, back in 2015, I did write a book uh, called "Voices in the Storm." And that was specifically about the blizzard of 66. And I wrote that book because 2015 was just about the, it was be coming up on the 50th anniversary of the blizzard, which hit, which hit in late January, actually right around today. Uh, let's see how many years ago would that have been? Uh, 58 years ago, 57 years ago. Uh, it hit late January. Some of you may remember it or, or at least remember hearing about it. And I was a 10 year old uh, boy living uh, outside of Fulton in the country. We were snowed in for weeks. And uh, so I, I just was curious as an adult looking back what other people had, uh, what other memories people had of that storm. And uh, pardon the pun, but I was buried with uh, responses. Probably 200 people got to me with their stories. And that's how I wrote that book. It, uh, and it was uh, well received. I did a lot of programs, such as the program I'm doing for you today, uh, specifically about that blizzard. And inevitably, at the end of the program, somebody would raise their hand and say, I remember this about the storm, or this happened to me. And these stories that they were telling me were good, as good as the ones that were in my book. So I decided to start collecting those stories, thinking that I might, uh, might, uh, one day write a sequel to that book. So I wanna show you a couple of pictures that people sent me. Now that picture, and by the way, none of these pictures are Photoshop. These, these are actually snowfall uh, images without any uh, uh, enhancement. Uh, this is from the blizzard of 66 in Oswego, New York. That's a full-sized adult that you can see in the foreground. I don't know how well you can see, but in the background of that picture is a child. And that ultimately, ultimately became the cover of my book if you wanna see them. That's what I used to take the cover, but, uh, and then people sent pictures from elsewhere. Now this one's from Newark, New York, which I know isn't far from you. And uh, I love this picture for a couple of reasons. One is uh, the amount of snow, but I didn't just the, I'm, I'm wondering what's going through that man, man's mind when he opens his garage door and said, you know, I have to shovel this to get out of my, get my car out of my garage. But here's another picture from that same scene uh, or just a slightly different picture, but, you can see a car there off to the right. So you get the, 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 the depth of that blizzard. That car was literally covered by that drift. The other thing I hope you can see is the texture of the snow it, where, it was, where it's been attempted to shovel. It was almost, uh, almost looks like sandstone to me or gravelly in a way. And that's because of the blizzard winds, which were 60 plus mile an hour, just knock those snowflake molecules together and uh, actually kind of sealed them together. Many people told me that shoveling in that blizzard or after that blizzard was like, uh, more like pitching 
uh, picking at it with an ax or a, maybe a barn shovel to try to get rid of that snow. It was like concrete. Here's another storm uh, picture from 66 in, uh, um, in Sandy Creek, New York. So, you know, people kept um, uh, talking about, but every once in a while, somebody would say to me, Jim, you, you wrote about the wrong storm. 1958 was the big blizzard or 1947 was the big blizzard. So that got me curious of how far I could go back in history to uh, research major snowstorms in our area. And that's the result of the new book. Uh, so I actually traveled back in time to the 1700s. And we're going to get into that in a second. But before I move on to some stories from the book, I want to share a little bit with you how I wrote this book. So what you're going to see here are uh, different words. The bigger the font, the more important the, that was to my research. And you can see that newspapers were really a major uh, source of research for me, uh, especially when you go back prior to 1930, 20, the 1800s. No one around today is going to remember those storms. Uh, but the newspapers from those time periods really captured the storms. The, the newspapers, I would almost call them charming. Uh, it's very different than the newspapers that we read today. The reporters from back then often wrote uh, expressively to describe what they saw. So I really uh, got a lot out of those newspapers to research those older storms. Books, I read a lot of books on meteorologists, on meteorology. I was trying to educate myself on uh, the phenomenon of lake effect snow. And you can see er interviews. I interviewed about 70 people for this new book, journals and diaries. The wonderful, wonderful thing that uh, I've discovered is that many people kept diaries back in the old days, uh, back in the 1900s, 1800s. A uh, lot of the times the farmers did because they wanted to record the weather to get an idea of when they might plant their crops in the new season. Uh, so folklore, you know, some people told me stories, but they weren't sure they were accurate. So if I put them in the book, I labeled them as folklore and not true fact. Uh, Letters, people wrote letters home, meteorological papers. So that's how I did my research for the book. I'm not sure if you can see all the names on the screen here, but one of my goals for this book was to reach as far into uh, central New York as I could. Because I'm from Oswego County, that Blizzard of 66 book that I wrote uh, primarily focused on Oswego, Onondaga County, a little bit of Cuga County, but I really tried to reach, and you can see that there are about 100 towns, villages, and little hamlets that are featured in my book, uh, at least one story or two stories about that, that place. Now, I'm not sure if you're gonna recognize this man. Uh, he may be a little bit out of your zone for watching uh, the news, uh, but this is Jim Teske. He's the chief meteorologist for News Channel 9 out of Syracuse. And Jim, uh, uh, I, I wanted someone to, re to read my research. The opening chapter of my book does describe uh, lake effect snow, the phenomenon of lake effect snow. I wanted to make sure that I was being accurate. So I just emailed Jim and asked if he might be willing to read a little of my book just to make sure I was being accurate. And he was the nicest guy. He, he gladly gave me some uh, suggestions. And then he told me his story about growing up in central New York. He grew up outside of uh, Syracuse in a little town called uh, Fremont or a little village and uh, Jim was a snow lover back when he was a kid. So I got to have his story in the book too. So it was a pleasure to work with him. One of the things that uh, uh, I was aware of, and you're probably aware of, is you know the phenomenon of lake effect snow. But one of the things I've learned about my books is that even though I write about local history, sometimes people send my books elsewhere, maybe to a relative in Texas or Florida. And I realize they may not know what lake effect snow is and how it works. So I do have a little part of that first chapter where I talk about the lake effects, but as you can see from my graphic here, there's the Great Lakes. And you know we know we get snow from Lake Ontario. We also know we probably get a little snow from Lake Erie. We certainly have this year when that big snow came in to Buffalo, we actually got some of the remnants of that. But we also get lake effect from all of the Great Lakes. And that's a pretty much of a phenomenon. And if you can see where central New York is, you know, if that westerly, northwesterly wind comes across those Great Lakes, we're going to, it's going to dump in central New York because we're the last stop on the train, if you will. Um, as I was researching my, my book, 
uh, I had this image, I'm a storyteller, right? And I had this image in my mind of a single snowflake, you know, so all these phenomenon, phenomenal snowstorms that we receive are the result of tiny snowflakes, billions, trillions of them, of course, but they each are one individual snowflake. And I thought, could I tell the story of how Lake Effect Snow works through the voice of a single snowflake? So I opened the book with a chapter of uh, explaining Lake Effect Snow as told by a snowflake. And by the way, many of us think of a snowflake like we're seeing on the screen right now, a perfectly shaped six, six pronged uh, snowflake. But here's an actual uh, Lake Effect snowflake, okay? It uh, looks a little different. Actually, these are several snowflakes and they vary in size. Uh, the bigger clump that you're seeing in the bottom center, that's about one inch long or wide, excuse me. And uh, um, what happens, and you may know this, but uh, what happens is as the snow falls from the clouds to the sky, uh, they, they, they sometimes merge with each other. It's called branching. They connect with each other. And that's what makes those big lake effect snows flakes that you might have seen in your time. So anyway, I decided to tell my story of a single snowflake. I named my snowflake Terry in honor of Lake Ontario, which is the, where we get most of our snow. And then I go ahead and tell the, the uh, story of how a snowflake starts as a drop of water in Lake Ontario and then follows the cycle. Uh, I really enjoyed writing that chapter. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to uh, take a little walk back in time. I'm gonna show you some pictures and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, a little bit about the stories of, uh, that are in the book. Now, my book starts with 1723. Now, uh, as you probably are aware, uh, there wasn't a lot of civilization or organized communities back in 1723. It, you know, we were still a wilderness area, but it certainly still had lake effect snow. And I was able to read some journals of some people who traveled through the area, describing uh, the snow that they were seeing. So, but the first real story is this one. And that is uh, the gentleman you're seeing is Colonel Marinus Willett. And he was uh, in the United States Army. Well, not the United States Army. It, uh, it was the, and we were fighting for our independence in the Revolutionary War. So we weren't even a country yet. Uh, uh, Colonel Willett was stationed at Fort Herkimer, which is, I believe, now uh, called Fort Stanwyck, maybe. It's in the Herkimer area. Uh, and he uh, had uh, a fort that he was uh, in charge of. General George Washington soon to be our first president of the United States, uh, commissioned or uh, ordered Colonel Willett to march his men to Fort Oswego. And that postcard you're seeing on the screen is an image from that time period. Fort Ont It's now called Fort Ontario, and you maybe you visited, visited that in the city of Oswego, but it was called Fort Oswego back then. And in 1783, it was still controlled by the British Army. General Washington wanted to take that fort over so that it could become uh, a uh, opening, a gateway to uh, people coming in from the lake, people leaving through the river, that he could have control of that. So he commissioned Colonel Willett to march 100 of his men from Fort Herkimer to Fort Oswego, 100 miles in February 1783. So you can imagine the conditions that those men marched in. Now, why February? Well, some of it was just uh, the, you know, the war was nearing its end. General Washington wanted to bring a conclusion to uh, overtaking that, that uh, fort, but also uh, he followed uh, um, astronomy and there was gonna be no moon or a new moon, we would call it on a certain night in February. He knew it would be pitch dark and that's, he wanted Colonel Willett to attack the fort in the middle of the night, surprise the British and take it over. So the men are marching. Uh, when they get closer to uh, the Oswego area, it's all wilderness. So they find a Native American who knows the area extremely well and work out a, a deal with the Native American that he's gonna be their guide to the fort. They get within four miles of the fort. This is nightfall is approaching. And as you can imagine, guess what happens? Boom, they hit a lake effect snowstorm, a major lake effect snowstorm. 
And this Native American guide stops in his tracks. And Colonel Willett says to him, what's wrong? We need to keep going. And the guide says, I don't know where I am. So uh, that's the story, you know, and it doesn't have a very happy ending, unfortunately. Uh, uh, by this time, Colonel Willett's men are, are near exhaustion. They're starting to get frostbite. There's no food left. They can't wait any longer. They turn around and go back. But I start the book with this story because it shows the power of lake effect snow. It really did affect uh, our country's uh, attempt to uh, win the war and, and get our freedom from from Britain. So uh, let's move on to our next story. Uh, and this is uh, 1816, the year without a summer. Some of you may have heard about this. It's fairly famous, but I, I researched it. Uh, I would rather call it 1816, the year of a full, a full year of winter. Okay. Uh, and here's what happened. In 1816, in Indonesia, a volcano erupted and it spewed ash throughout the atmosphere, really covering most of the world. And this is an artist rendition of what that might have looked like. And the world darkened. Crops could not uh, be raised. Uh, people could not uh, find warmth. And there were no seasons to tell of. So why would I put this uh, story about central New York storms in my book? Well, I was uh, luckily able to uncover a diary from a farming family in Cayuga County. And uh, they, the woman who wrote the diary talked about the conditions through the whole year. And it just read like a full winter, frost in July, snow in August, uh, just uh, freaky, I guess you'd call it. Um, and so uh, I, wanted, I wanted to uh, illustrate the impact that that devastation had on the whole world right here in central New York. I did wanna have uh, one, at least one story about uh, lake uh, ships on the lake that are caught in winter storms. If you like reading about Lake Ontario or ships or shipwrecks, there's a wonderful author named uh, Susan Peterson Gately. She's from Fairhaven uh, in uh, Cuga County, and she writes extensively. And with her permission, I use one of the stories from 1880 about a ship that was trying to come in from Lake Ontario into the Oswego Harbor you would think that once it got near the harbor, once it got in, it would be able to uh, get in okay. But what happened was a lake effect storm was heading out into the lake, kind of, it must've been a north, nor'easter because it was coming in the opposite direction. And it pushed that ship back out to the lake. Uh, not a very happy ending for the ship. Thankfully, nobody died, but uh, it was a pretty dramatic uh, representation. Susan Gately uh, estimates there are about 250 ships at the bottom of Lake Ontario that are the result of bad storms, many of them winter storms uh, on Lake Ontario. And we do get a lot of snow here. Maybe you've seen pictures like this before. Maybe you've experienced snow like this. This is from the Tug Hill area. We hear a lot about Tug Hill getting a lot of snow. Uh, one of the things that intrigued me about my research is the snow, the efforts of the snow plow drivers and the snow plows trying to clean up those math, massive storms. You know, nowadays when we get snow, we see these, you know, huge towering snow plows that come in to clear our streets and they do it, it seems without much effort, right? But in the old days, in the 40s, the 30s, 40s, 50s, the kinds of plows that you're seeing in, in this photo right here are the kinds of plows that tried to clear our streets. If we got substantial snow, like in this storm, and let's see, this, this picture is from Mexico, New York, uh, that snow plow would gonna have a hard time to get through that snow, which makes it understandable why people would tell stories about, we were snowed in for two weeks or three weeks because it would take a long time for those smaller vehicles to clear the road. Here's another example. This guy's plane stuck right here. He's not, he's not going anywhere, uh, at least until somebody can pull him out. That is from, uh, let me see, that picture is from uh, Richland, New York, up near the Tug Hill area. Now, uh, the next thing that I'm gonna show you, uh, I, I reached out to historical societies all over central New York and Oneida County uh, helped me greatly with stories from their area. And the person who uh, works at the Oneida County Historical Center told me uh, that he had a video of Snowplow in the 1940s. 
and would I like to see it? And of course I did, and I wanted to see it. It was about 20 minutes long, it's fascinating. If you're interested after the program, I can give you information on how you can look it up on YouTube. But I asked him permission if I could show two minutes of the, um, of the um, snowplow. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna do right now. Uh, hopefully you're gonna be able to hear. Now, if you'll see the picture, the, small, the picture in the center is this video from 1947 in Oneida County of a snowplow getting through some pretty towering snow. But up in the right-hand corner, you're gonna see the head of a gentleman. His name is Ernest Portner. And his father was driving snowplow in that video, and he's gonna he's gonna narrate it for narrate it for us. So here you go. It'll go about two minutes, and then I'll come back in. This was a storm of '47. There about 12 feet of snow in there. This was our old lens we had. We used the rotary in there to widen it back. This is on the road to Tabor. There's probably 10, 12 feet of snow in there. That's been plugged for two weeks. This was a storm of 47. You didn't have to back up with that lens. She pushed right through. <laughs> you didn't need any heat in there either. The, the guy driving it to sweat would be rolling right off of him, right in the shirt sleeves. Uh, uh, uh. This is out on the West Milan Road. This is 47. The last year we plowed, uh, we had a pretty bad storm there. This was the first rotary that the Nida County had, the first rotary plow. It didn't work out good because those paddles would break off. They'd go out to shoot, be like a, sending a missile out. This was out by the O'Brien O'Brien Road on the Westland Road. This was the first first rotary the county had. That barn's long gone now. It was storming pretty good that day. I don't know if any of you remember the storm of '47, but it started snowing the first of March. The ground was bare. Snowed for two weeks, steady, night and day, and it snowed. It was heavy, and it plugged everything. They had to airdrop uh, food to people because you, you just couldn't move, and the roads were plugged. Okay, That's this is still down on the Westland Road. Okay, so that's the end there. I hope you could hear that okay. And uh, I just, um, a couple of things I love about that video is, uh, you know, you could hardly see sometimes the snow plow, that snow was coming down so much. And many of the pictures people send me, understandably so, are pictures of the storm aftermath, right? You know, the you, we could see how big the drifts are, but to be in the middle of those storms, uh, and I really admire those snowplow drivers. Many of them were uh, day and night trying to clear those those uh, streets. Uh, the, uh, something that uh, Ernest said a little later in the program that I thought was pretty funny. He said that you know sometimes, as you know, a snowplow will hit a, a a mailbox and knock it down and send it flying, and and the snowplow drivers call that air mail. So um, we're going to go. Uh, some more stories quickly here. Uh, one of the things that um, happens when you do research with newspapers, at least it happened to me, it, once you do, when you do, you just keep looking at newspapers for days after days after days, you start seeing headlines in your head. So I thought, gee, it'd be fun in my PowerPoint to do headlines for you to describe a few of the other stories that are in my book, but they're, you're gonna, they're gonna read like headlines. So we're gonna go through those now pretty quickly. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show a picture and then I'll put a headline up. And uh, the picture doesn't always exactly match the headline, but I use the picture to illustrate sort of the, the feel of the story, if you will, or the emotion of the story. So this picture came from uh, 1945. Uh, this is another snowplow stuck. He is literally stuck in these snowbanks on either side of him. And here's my headline that again, doesn't match the picture, but it's similar. I hope you can read that headline all right. I'll read it for you. February 1945, Cassville, Oneida County, 
School bus lodged between snowbanks, children trapped. Now just imagine being a child on that school bus. That bus, those, that road was plowed so narrow, the bus got stuck and the children were in there for hours. Thankfully, everybody was rescued, no one was hurt, but it's pretty scary. Um, and that's the reality of you know, the roads back when they had those smaller, smaller snow plows. January 1925, Syracuse, record-breaking snow collapses roofs, SU students hired to shovel. Uh, this picture actually comes from uh, Richland, but it illustrates, I don't know if you can see way back, there's sort of a wing of the plow kind of in the top center. Uh, and those, those college students had to dig that plow out. I don't think they missed going to class that day though. Uh, I have several stories from Fairhaven Beach. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the, with the state park there in Fairhaven. This is uh, the, the caretakers of the uh, beach. A man's name is uh, Harold Northrup. And he was the supervisor from 1938 to 1963. That's a long tenure as a supervisor of a state park. And he had some amazing stories that I was able to uncover about uh, storms during uh, at that beach area, which is right on Lake Ontario. The story that I focus on today, though, is a few years before he took that job. And this photograph is actually from uh, the story that I'm going to tell you. So this is December, January 1935-36, Fairhaven State Park. Civilian Conservation Corps comes to Village's rescue. You might be familiar with the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, created that program to put men back to work after the Depression. And uh, group crews of men were stationed all over the United States, including 200 men at the Fairhaven State Park in 1935. Now, I don't know if you know that state park, but I can't imagine there were any real buildings back then in 35. Those men must have existed in lean-tos and tents. But uh, what happened, and here's a picture from that, uh, the village, the storm was so severe, the village was running out of food. And so they put this contraption together. You're seeing sort of a tractor-like device at the beginning, at the front. And behind it, those people are sitting on a toboggan those men went to the nearest village, which was Red Creek, the next village over, got food, brought it back to Fairhaven to save the village. One of the things that really impressed me was that gentleman at the top, his job was when it got dark, he flashed a flashlight ahead of him. There were no lights on that contraption. They were, they were driving in the dark. I, I can't imagine how they made it back. Uh, February 1958, Sterling, only three school days in February. Girl views plow from top of top power toll, pole, excuse me. Again, the picture doesn't quite uh, match the story, but it still certainly illustrates it. By the way, the woman who told me this story was upset that she only had three school days. And when I asked her why, she said she was studying for her regents and she couldn't get to school to go to her study group. I think she was probably the only student in the area that cared about whether she was in school or not. Um, most people would have uh, prohibited or been unhappy with the amount of snow that we were getting, but there was probably one job that kind of liked the big snow drifts. Maybe this guy. Uh, this is an actual photo from a telephone. Uh, he worked for the telephone company out of Mexico, New York. He didn't need a ladder to get up to the top of the pole with that storm, did he? Uh, here's an actual photo from the actual story. Uh, December 1958, Oswego. Mayor needs dog sled to survey snowbound city. Yeah, those, that's a real dog sled. The mayor is behind it. And those are Alaskan Huskies. Why they were, maybe somebody raised Huskies in Oswego, I don't know, but it was the only way he was going to able to get around to, uh, to survey the, the, uh, what he had to deal with for his city to open up again. Uh, this Again, this picture does not match the story, but I think it, match, it ma uh, matches the innocence. April 1975, Fayetteville, five-year-old trapped in a well rescued by dog. So uh, let's look at some of the details here. April, very late for a winter storm, wouldn't you say? But what happened was heavy rains had come in earlier in April and then it got a cold spell. Snow came in, collapsed a well. A girl was playing outside with her friend. She fell into the well. And there's a wonderful rescue story about the, how the dog rescued her. So it, it has a happy ending. January, 1976, Adams. The town is in the running for the snowiest place in America. So 
one of the things I did learn, you know, I don't have a lot of measurements in my book. After a while, you see numbers and they all start blending together. And it's to me, the story is more important than how much snow. But in this particular storm, January 76, Adams received 68 inches of snow in 24 hours. That's phenomenal. Now, I think Buffalo, New York, either matched or surpassed that in recent that recent storm they got. But back in 76, that was in the running for the snowiest 24-hour total in the United States. They lost, however, to Colorado by one inch. So Adams was uh, not real happy about that. Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning of my program that uh, I wrote that book on the blizzard of 66, people kept telling me stories. And I originally thought I might do a sequel and do a whole other book on snowstorm stories, but then I got the idea of going back in time and researching. So what I do is I stop my chronological order of my new book at the, at the end of the 1970s and 1980. And I know you're on mute and you can't, usually at, at this point I ask the audience, can you have a, do you have a guess why I stopped chronologically at the end of the 70s? And sometimes people say, you know, uh, uh, global warming, climate change, they, they'll say uh, we aren't getting the big storms like we used to. And some of those are maybe partially true, but uh, my reason was uh, we're a different world now. We have modern technology. We have cell phones, internet, Doppler, the weather channel, 24 hours a day. You know, back prior to 1980, we did not have those uh, devices to help us. That storm in, in in Buffalo was tragic just a few weeks ago. People did die, but people also had cell phones and, and there was somewhat of a warning before that storm came in. Back in the 40s and 50s, if you were out in the storm, you might've been stuck out in that storm. Or if you were home, you were stuck home until you could get help or until you were able to dig yourself out. So just to uh, put perspective on it, the last chapter of my book goes back to the blizzard of 66. And I tell about 30 new stories that people told me, and I'm gonna go through just a few of them real fast here uh, with some uh, headlines for you. So here we go. A nurse from New Haven hops snowmobile to make her shift in Oswego. So I love this uh, story. New Haven's about uh, eight or 10 miles from Oswego. She really wanted to get in to make her shift uh, where she was working. Uh, she hopped a snowmobile, she hopped on the back of a snowmobile, made it halfway there, then hopped into a Jeep that had no floor in it. So she really, she really had quite an adventuresome ride to get to her shift. Cato School's maintenance man drives unplowed roads to Pennsylvania for coal. So schools closed down, uh, kids didn't go to school, teachers didn't go to school, but the maintenance people had to keep those buildings heated or else the pipes would freeze. And this man's job uh, for the Cato schools was to drive down an 18 wheeler every so often and get snow and get coal. During Blizzard of 66, he was told that that 18 wheeler would not make it down there. The roads were just too narrow. So he drew, drove a truck there and uh, came back with the coal. So it's a good story. He was a hero. About three or four weeks ago, I was in uh, Puka County near Cato telling the story a man raised his hand and said, I was that man. <laughs> so I got to meet him in person. I got the story out of the newspaper, but um, it was quite a, quite a dramatic story that he told. Fulton Teen carries food from his father's diner to the family home. So I'm from Fulton, so I had a particular uh, attachment to the story. His family lived about four miles outside of the town where the diner was. His family was stuck at home. This teenager's family was stuck at home. They were running out of food. The father somehow got a hold of the teenager at a friend's house in town and said, you need to go to the diner, get some food and bring it to us. And the story of how that young boy breaks into the diner because he doesn't have keys and gets the food that his dad asked him to get and carries it back home. It's a pretty dramatic story. Andy Creek boy describes total amazement after the blizzard. I loved interviewing people, adults who were children when these storms hit because somehow they seem more magical, more mystical, more uh, momentous, if you will. And his description of what he saw after the blizzard was uh, really amazement. Camilla's college student breaks leg skiing, watches blizzard from the hospital bed. So I love this story. You know, 
She'd never skied before, chose to go skiing during the blizzard of 66 and ends up breaking her leg, goes to the hospital. So you think it's, you know, she's safe. She's there for about a week. But she told me that uh, during the blizzard, as that snow kept mounting up the window, her hospital window, that a crack developed in the window diagonally. Pretty scary. Wayne County woman heads for SUNY Oswego, Braves blizzard in a 1958 Chevy. So this story has all the elements of, you know, just a yeah, hero's journey. The woman was driving alone. It was dark. She's driving in a stick shift. Uh, she makes it in second gear all the way to Oswego, but pretty dramatic story of how she braved that storm. Oswego County ham radio operators send relief to rural residents. So um, I always considered ham radio operators kind of a hobby, but during this blizzard and other storms, they really were heroes. If you think about prior to cell phones and internet uh, and GPS, if somebody was stranded in the rural area and needed groceries or medicine, how would they get them? How would they even know where that home was? And ham radio operators really came to the rescue of those rural folks. A pregnant Liverpool woman hitchhikes to Fulton during blizzard to reunite with family. So uh, this is a pretty dramatic story and I will tell you a little bit about it so you don't think this woman was crazy. Uh, she was six months pregnant. Uh, she and her husband had a two-year-old child that they dropped off at uh, her in-laws in Fulton, which is about 25 miles from Liverpool, and went back to Liverpool to go to a party and then spend the night and then they were gonna get up the next day and go pick up their two-year-old Till your old daughter and bring her back home. Well, the storm hit and the woman, as she described it to me, she said she's sitting in her home and she could not be away from her daughter that long. She just couldn't stand that feeling. So she said to her husband, we're going to hitchhike to Fulton. <laughs> and somehow she made it. Um, uh, everybody was okay. The baby, three months later, the baby was born. No problem. Here's another pregnancy story, but a little different. A Swigo veterinarian travels during blizzard to help dog deliver pups um, so uh, the dog uh, got through that safely. 12-year-old Cicero boy caught in blizzards mini tornado. Now there weren't tornadoes during the blizzard, but if you recall, if you happen to be in that blizzard or sometimes heavy winds when they go in between buildings, they will circulate. They kind of try to find their way out of that, that wherever they're caught. And it felt like a mini tornado. This boy was out trying to shovel his driveways. They had sent him outside to shovel during the blizzard. I'm not sure why his dad sent him outside, but uh, it was pretty scary for him to be in the middle of that, what felt like a tornado. And I'm gonna end my program here. And this is how I end the book. Uh, this is a picture of a man named Willard uh, Bill Spaulding. And during a program I was doing about the blizzard of 66, a gentleman, an older gentleman stood up, introduced himself as uh, Bill Spaulding and uh, was from the town of Oswego. And he said, uh, during the blizzard of 66, he was stationed in Okinawa, Japan. And he had a day off, was gonna go down to the commissary and uh, find, uh, get a snack and find an American newspaper. And he said, I'm looking at the newspapers and all of a sudden on the front page of a newspaper, he sees Oswego, New York, his hometown uh, in a snowstorm. And he says to his buddies, uh, that's where I'm from. And, you know, the, his friends were like, oh, you're just making that up. And he goes, you know, I wished I'd bought a copy of that newspaper because it really did happen. Well, he and I exchanged email addresses. And three or four months later, I got this in the mail or a copy of this in the mail. And there's the newspaper that he was talking about. Um, maybe you've heard of the Stars and Stripes. It's a uh, newspaper that sent overseas to military to keep them up to date on uh, news. And if you can see the date on the paper, it's February, uh, it's black, my picture's blocking. I think it's the sixth, maybe 1966. Um, but that, you know, there was a late January storm, right? And that's a Swigo, New York on the front cover. So of that newspaper. So I end this program and I end my book to talk about Central New York snowstorms are world famous. Uh, we were on Walter Cronkite at one point. Johnny Carson joked about us on The Tonight Show. Uh, and so it, it becomes international news. I think our snowstorms are something to be proud of. Um, not probably everybody wouldn't agree that with me on that, but I do. So um, here's the front cover of the book. I wanted to show you this for a couple of reasons. Um, 
my first few books, including the Blizzard of 66 book, I did self-publish those books. But now I work with a company called Arcadia, the History Press, and they're a wonderful company to work with. They focus on local history. But when you work with a publishing company, they choose the title of the book and they choose the front cover image. So you kind of give them some suggestions and you hope that they will create something. And I think they did a great job. This is from a 1947 storm outside of Oswego, the town of Oswego. That little snowplow is going to try to get through that ma mammoth snowdrift. And, you know, two, shovel two shovelers are trying to get him out. So it kind of illustrates to me the, the challenges we had in historic snowstorms. So I want to thank you for your attendance today. I think uh, maybe Marty will take over here and tell us how we're going to pursue, pursue from here. Wow. Thanks, Jim. Uh, that sure brought back home a lot of, a lot of memories for me. I, I was in Western New York during the, uh, the blizzard of 77, uh, which wow. was very, very memorable outside of the Buffalo area. So uh, on Jim's slide here, you can see his email address if you'd like to contact him. Uh, also his webpage where you can find information about his writings um, and uh, the availability of his books. Um, can I, I mention one thing, Marty? Sure. Um, I did talk to a couple of places um, in the Geneva area, the Stomping Grounds and uh, the Village Store. Both of those have carried my book uh, the village store is out of the book right now. They're going to reorder it, but it, you, you could, if you want to go buy the book uh, in one of those places, uh, they could help you out with that. Great. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. So um, I think we can open it up for uh, questions. You're welcome or comments. You're welcome to uh, put that in the chat and I will share that with everybody else, but you're also welcome at this point. I think we can, if you want to unmute and make comments or ask Jim questions, uh, go ahead. And uh, if people have had a chance to write down the uh, email address and the URL for his webpage, um, then Jim can probably stop sharing and, and uh, we can continue with uh, question and answers. Anybody? Feel free to unmute or put a note in the in the chat. Um, just that it's very interesting, and um, I don't remember all those. I remember nineteen. Uh, well, the ones in the nineteen seventies, I think we saw. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of really great illustrations, Jim, that you came up with. That's that's Thank very you. cool. I see a question. Uh, what were the exact dates of the 66 blizzard? No. Yep, that's a good question because um, depending on where you lived, uh, it would depend on when that storm started. Um, those of us in Oswego County, that storm started on a Friday, Thursday to Friday. Some school, some children didn't have school that Friday morning. That would have been the 27th, 28th of January. Uh, but what happened, the, the lake effect storm then merged with a nor'easter. We know this now in retrospect. I don't think we called them nor'easters back then, but a storm that came up the East Coast, because even places like New York City, they also got some of that lake blizzard. And that came into more late January 29th, 30th, first, February 1st were the dates of the storm. By February 2nd, Groundhog's Day, so you can imagine the Groundhog was going to have a hard time finding the shadow that day. It would the storm would have been over by uh, by that date. Did you interview any farmers who shared impact? Yes, yes. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I also wrote a book about the muck farms of Oswego County. Uh, farming is in my family. I had two uncles that were muck farmers, so I I am always uh, very keen on farmer's perspective. And uh, I have in the book, uh, the diary of a farm wife, if you will, uh, the, a woman who helped run the farm with her husband. And she kept, uh, well, what I, I shouldn't say what else does she have to do? I shouldn't mean that, but she was stuck home all those days. And she wrote very extensively about what it was like on their farm during that storm. Absolutely. Farmers, uh, I think I mentioned that that uh, 1816 year without a summer, 
that was a farmer's journal that I that I worked from. So uh, I uh, dairy farmers, a lot of dairy farmers, uh, their milk, they ended up dumping the milk. Some tried to make as much ice cream and cheese as they could so they could put the milk to good use so that it wouldn't go bad because they couldn't get to the processing plants. Yes. No one has a story for me, huh? <laughs> Let's go for a week. Well, I, I know in the blizzard of 77, I had um, some errands that I had to run and on my way home, it hit. And mm -hmm. um, I was closer to Buffalo. We lived about 20 miles outside of the city. And uh, my car, um, I had um, somebody, no, I was by myself, but my car finally just died because it, it the snow was just blowing in under the engine and everything. Mm -hmm. And so I, hitched a ride with somebody else and the snow was coming down so hard I actually got out and walked sort of ahead of him so that I could see a little further ahead than the car and uh, eventually um, didn't make it home that first night got home the next day by hitching a ride in the back of a pickup that was able to my parents weren't didn't get home for three or four days at least they got stuck at some somebody on there they were driving and got stuck and the neighbors took them in um, that was, that was, uh, was a big, it was quite the deal. Um, yeah. And I, re I remember sort of, uh, laughing at my grandfather who would talk about snowstorms in the past where the snow was so deep, it would go right up to the height of the telephone wires. And it's like, yeah, sure. But that <laughs> year I saw it too. Um, I see we have another question. How did they get an old plow through a huge drift? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it seems funny, but it was snow shovelers. Yeah, well, they could, you know, another truck might come and pull it out of that, uh, where it was stuck from, if it had enough uh, horsepower, it would pull them out. Um, but oftentimes, uh, snow shovelers, people shoveling. Uh, I have some stories about railroads, uh, how railroad, the tracks, uh, the drifts would go over the tracks, and uh, they would hire hundreds hundreds of people uh, to shovel those free and shovel those tracks free. So uh, good old fashioned snow shoveling. Uh, you don't read you don't read much about uh, snow blowers or you know personal snow plows that people a lot of people have those in their homes now but you know back in the earlier days no not yeah. so much. Not so much. Yeah I think uh, probably be good to clarify that there are actually at least two different types of snow equipment the one is um the, the v-shaped snow plow that we saw many pictures of but then there was also the rotary plows or what we might call a snow blower so there were there were at least two different ones like that i remember a drift near our house during that that uh after that blizzard that was you know solid probably probably 10 feet tall just solid and the the snow plow with the v plow on the front would back up and ram it and then it would back up and ram it and back up and ram it until he finally pushed his way through. But then later a, a snow blower, like the rotary plow, like we saw came through and widened it um, and was able to blow it back. Yeah, We have a, was a good word you used Marty, solid. Um, I mean, it was, people describe it as concrete. Some of those storms concrete like so a little shoveling is not, or just a small plow is not gonna get through that. So there's a couple more things in the chat. Knowing state roads were plowed first, remember farmers using own equipment, loaders, et cetera, cleared town roads. Good point. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yes, I, I, there's a story in my family, my uncle, uh, he lived, obviously lived in the country with his farm and he used his tractor with a plow on it because the the, there weren't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of snow plow equipment. Uh, and so they, they did the main roads first uh, and then got to the secondary roads when they could. So farmers would often come to the rescue of those places. So that's why when you hear stories about people snowed in for two, three weeks, it seems incredible, but it's true. 
Another comment here says, I'm, I'm from Long Island, where they speak of the blizzard of 1888. Yes, I do write about that blizzard, um, and uh, I just didn't mention it today. There are actual two, there are actually two blizzards in 1888, believe it or not. One was in the Midwest, and that was called the Children's Blizzard. And unfortunately, it was called the Children's Blizzard because that uh, blizzard hit uh, most places, most of the Midwest in the daytime. Children were at school and got trapped and tried to get home. Many perished. But the, the blizzard that hit the East Coast was uh, also in 1888, and that was devastating. New York City was devastated. Um, and uh, I have some stories in, uh, in my book that the when the storm hit central New York, I have some people's memories of that. That was, that was a huge storm, yes. Another comment, my grandpa had a John Deere crawler. It would crawl up over the drifts. He cleared the road between his farm and ours about a mile. Wow, amazing, yeah, yeah. Uh, over the drift, that's amazing, that's amazing. I grew up in uh, Galeville section of Liverpool, New York, and uh, during the 50s and 60s, and uh, we got hammered every time there was a storm. Uh, we got them in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And uh, I can remember we, uh, my brother and I used to shovel the driveway of an older couple down the street. And during the 66 blizzard, uh, we were out shoveling while the blizzard was going on. <laughs> and uh, we were there about an hour and a half and we got, and it was a 50 foot driveway and we're still shoveling. We got down to the end of the driveway and we, we finally got it done and we looked back and uh, the driveway was already filled with another 18 inches of snow. <laughs> and I just turned to my brother and he said, we're going home, forget <laughs> it. We'll, we'll, we'll tell them we'll come back when it stops snowing. So, uh, and uh, I, I think we got like four feet of snow out of that storm, I don't know, or more. Yeah. So we always, we always were getting four and five feet of snow in that area. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah I, we write we measure snow in feet around here, not inches so much, right? Yes. Not not so much these days, but back in the day we did. Yeah, did you get paid for that? Or was that? Um, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, they paid us. They paid us well. Uh, they they were very nice people. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people could make money uh, shoveling snow back yeah. then. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for those memories. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Greatly yes, indeed. Thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank very, you. It was, it was nice engaging, to be here. Very engaging stories. Um, one more oh, comment. Yeah. Comment oh, here. yeah. Uh, this is from Dan, it looks like. Yeah, I know that book, Dan, and I... Uh, um, I'm just going to mention something real quickly here. Uh, there was a professor at SUNY Oswego named Bob Sykes. And uh, Bob was a big fan of um, this gentleman that you're talking about who did the Snowflake book. And uh, so I got to see his work. Phenomenal. He, he took photographs of snowflakes, some of the first uh, actual photos of snowflakes that were able to be uh, professionally produced. Th yeah, thanks for mentioning that. In the 1800s. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jim. Very engaging. Lots of great stories and great pictures. Really appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the program committee. So there's a group of us that uh, get together to to schedule, um, come up with come up with programs, and then uh, we get together to put together the the actual schedule and arrangements. Um, the committee members are Ann Brando, um, Josephine Perry, Barbara Bailey, Mary Jean Welser, Walt Gable, Don, Dan Weinstock, Norma Press. I also want to thank Norma for getting the handling the publicity, getting the word out, 
And I'd also like to just remind everybody, if you have suggestions for future programs or events, please get in touch with one of us so that we can uh, consider that the next time around. Also like to thank Historic Geneva for partnering with us and to all of you for attending and participating this afternoon. Thanks and have a great weekend. Thank you very much. It was great. <laughs>